So you've just come out of high school electricity and magnetism, and you've learned that charged parallel plates produce an electric field between them, and steady currents produce a magnetic field around them. You've got a long way to go, but it's a start. I'm going to explain to you a concept which you would normally only learn several years later when studying electrodynamics, because you already have the tools to understand it. And no, I'm not going to pull a pop science and wave my hands around and not actually tell you anything precise. We'll do some real maths and get some real results. We're going to talk about something called the pointing vector, which describes the flow of energy in electric and magnetic fields. If you're keeping up with Veritasium or several other YouTube channels, you already have been told that in an electric circuit, energy is not carried inside the wires, but in the surrounding electric and magnetic fields. To be clear, this is correct, although it's very easily misinterpreted, as you might have noticed from all the other videos around this topic, published in response to the Veritasium video in the last month. Here's what I'm going to do. First, I'll give a very simple and digestible example that demonstrates how energy flows in a resisting wire. Second, I'll extend this model to a practical example of a light bulb connected to a battery. And third, I'll give some insight into how we should actually interpret these results. As we're going, don't be afraid to pause the video whenever you want to take some time and make sure you understand. I won't judge you for it. Maths does not come quickly. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. We're going to start with a parallel plate capacitor, which is just two big metal plates charged with opposite electric charges. For simplicity, we'll assume the plates extend infinitely outwards. You might have heard somewhere that the electric field between two charged plates is uniform everywhere in the space between the plates. It points perpendicularly from the positive plate to the negative one, and has a magnitude of the voltage difference between the plates, which we'll call V, divided by the distance between the plates, which we'll call L. Let's keep these plates charged with a battery so that V stays constant. Consider the following. What happens if we string a wire between the two plates? Current will flow from one plate to the other, but since we're charging them with a battery, the voltage will remain the same. To be clear, this is a resisting wire, not an ideal wire. Conventionally, we denote the current I, for some reason. Hopefully you'll remember somewhere that a steady current produces a magnetic field which moves in a circle around the wire, and the direction of the circle can be found by the right-hand rule. Point your thumb in the direction of the current, and your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. Don't use your left hand, or it won't work. Conventionally, we denote the magnetic field B, for some reason. The magnitude of the magnetic field at any point turns out to be mu naught times the current divided by 2 pi times the distance from the wire, which we'll call R. Mu naught is just a constant that makes all the units work. It's basically just another pi in this equation. Now, I have just pulled these formulas out of thin air, but I'm not going to derive them because 1, the E and B field around a capacitor and a wire are something you can just physically measure, and 2, these are commonly some of the first things you learn when studying electricity and magnetism. Technically, both of these results come from Maxwell's equations, but that's getting too deep. Electric and magnetic fields contain energy, and the flow of that energy is described by the pointing vector. This is named after John Henry Pointing, and let's be honest, if your name is Pointing, and you're going to have something named after you, it better well be a vector. By convention, we denote the pointing vector with the letter S. Notation in electrodynamics just makes no sense. Now, the multiplication symbol here is a special vector product called the cross product. Without going into too much detail, if two vectors are perpendicular to each other, then the cross product of them is a third vector pointing perpendicular to both of them, with magnitude equal to the product of the magnitudes of the vectors being multiplied. The direction is again given by the right-hand rule. Point your thumb in the direction of the first vector, and your fingers in the direction of the second, and your palm faces in the direction of the cross product. Don't use your left hand, or it won't work. A lot of people like to point their middle finger in the third direction, but I prefer this right-hand slap rule because the direction of energy flow is in the direction of the slap. Now, the pointing vector can also be derived from Maxwell's equations and the energy content of electric and magnetic fields, but for now let's treat this quantity as a mysterious expression handed down from on high, and let's see what we can do with it. Let's pick a point between the plates of the capacitor and find the point's pointing vector. Since the E and B fields are perpendicular to each other at every point, the magnitude of S is just the magnitude of E times the magnitude of B divided by mu naught, which comes out to V times I divided by 2 pi RL. Using the right-hand rule, we find that the direction of the pointing vector is radially inwards towards the wire. That seems weird, but it will all make sense in a moment. Energy is flowing from all directions, so to get the total energy flowing into the wire, we need to take a cylindrical surface around the wire and total up the pointing vector across the entire surface. 
The magnitude of the pointing vector only depends on the distance from the wire, which is constant over the surface of the cylinder. So if the cylinder has radius r, then the total energy flow into the cylinder is just going to be vi over 2 pi rl times the area of the sides of the cylinder, which is 2 pi rl. So all of these terms cancel, and we're left with just the voltage times the current. Anyone who's done a small amount of circuitry should have a light bulb go on in their head right now, because they might already know that voltage times current is power. If a circuit component has a voltage across it and current flowing through it, then the energy consumption of the component per unit time is V times I. This wire, for example, has some resistance, which is turning electrical energy into heat, and we managed to get exactly the right result for precisely how much energy using the pointing vector. So yes, it is indeed true that energy in an electric circuit is transmitted by the electric and magnetic fields. Obviously, this is an oversimplified example. In reality, we don't just connect wires to batteries directly, we want to power a circuit component, like a light bulb. This seems much more complicated until you realize that a light bulb is actually just a wire. We've just specially chosen a material for the wire which lights up when it receives electrical energy instead of just heating up. Although, arguably, everything emits light if it's hot enough, so every wire is also technically a light bulb. So all we have to do to convert our current model to a battery and light bulb is to say that the wire connecting the plates is actually a lighting filament. Okay, but what if we don't have the giant metal plates? What if we just connect the battery to the light bulb with ideal wires? It looks like there's no electric field anymore, but there actually is. The wires are charged, and the charges produce an electric field. One way you can think of this is that the light bulb is a blockade in the circuit, preventing charges from getting through. And as a result, positive charges build up on one side, while negative charges build up on the other. These charges form on the surface of the wire, and are responsible for a lot of important properties of circuits. This is starting to get hand wavy, so let's wheel it back. Can we figure out some reasonably exact expressions for the electric and magnetic field? And if we do the same analysis for the pointing vector, do we still get P equals VI? The answer is yes, but it's really messy. Here you can see a Mathematica program I wrote to calculate everything for a square-shaped circuit. And if you want to look through the details yourself, there's a download link in the description. We have to make a small approximation and assume the wires are infinitely thin, but the result is still pretty precise. To cut to the chase, here's a diagram of the pointing vector showing the propagation of energy from the battery at the top of the circuit to the light bulb at the bottom. It's so beautiful. I'm so proud of this. I can't believe it actually worked. Before I look into how this relates to circuits more generally, I want to give another example of how this description of electrodynamics can be used. If energy is being transmitted outside the circuit, then can it be lost outside the circuit? Absolutely! And if you know a bit of vector calculus and Maxwell's equations, you can figure out how. For a vector field describing the flow of stuff, the divergence is a quantity that describes how much stuff is going into or out of each point. If the divergence of the pointing vector is negative at some point, then energy is being deposited at that point. If you use a simple identity from vector calculus, then substitute in Maxwell's equations, you can show that the divergence of the pointing vector is minus the dot product of E and J, where J is the current density. But currents always flow in the direction of electric fields, so if the point we're looking at is inside a conducting substance, then the electric field E induces a current J in the same direction, and so minus E dot J is negative. So if we surround the wire with a conducting material, energy is going to be wasted inside that material. Veritasium gives the historical example of an undersea transatlantic cable, which saw very poor signal quality. This makes sense with the divergence analysis, because salt water conducts electricity, and apparently the cable also had a metal sheath, so energy was being lost in the sheath as well. But actually, Derek says something interesting here. But as a good conductor, it interfered with the propagation of electromagnetic fields, because it increased the capacitance of the line. Why are we suddenly talking about capacitance? Actually, how does this all connect to circuits anyway? The theory of circuits, which is concerned with resistance and capacitance, and a couple of other properties of circuit components, can in theory be derived from electrodynamics. In fact, electrical engineering essentially replaces the E and B fields with capacitors and inductors. 
This is explained in more detail in a response to Veritasium's video by the YouTube channel Electroboom. This is how we engineers deal with fields around the circuits and lump them into more digestible components. And that model works surprisingly well. The only issue is that in practice you have to measure the inductance or capacitance rather than derive it from scratch, and these values can change depending on the electric properties of the surroundings. This doesn't feel as good because you're not getting to the nitty gritty fundamentals, but at the same time, there are uncountably many problems where you can't exactly find the electric and magnetic fields because it's just too hard. Often interpreting everything as a combination of resistors, inductors, and capacitors is far more enlightening. Both theories have advantages and disadvantages, and when they overlap, it's difficult to tell which one should be used. This led to a lot of tension and a lot of heated discourse across YouTube last month when the Veritasium video was released. So let's look briefly into that video. The thought experiment that Derek uses in his video is far from elementary, but it's a good example of how electrodynamics and the theory of circuits differ. If a battery is connected to a light bulb by one light second long wires, how long does the light bulb take to turn on? Derek argues that the answer is 1 over c seconds, which is weird because 1 over c is in units of seconds per meter, not seconds. What he's trying to say is that since the battery and light bulb are just one meter apart, it doesn't matter how long the wires are, the fields carry the energy across the gap. This is of course completely wrong, for two reasons. Firstly, look at the pointing vector field I derived for the small circuit. There is some energy going straight across the middle, but most of the energy flow is clustered around the wires, which makes sense because the electric and magnetic fields get weaker further away from the wires. Secondly, we're no longer looking at a static situation. Once the switch is flipped, the charges and fields change dynamically until they reach a new steady state, and describing this requires some much more complicated maths. Interestingly, although this looks like something that only electrodynamics can solve, you can model these long wires in the theory of circuits as transmission lines. In my opinion, the best analysis of Veritasium's thought experiment is from the Electroboom channel, where Mehdi provides not only a detailed description of what actually happens, but also backs up his results with simulations. That being said, I'm not sure I personally would want Mehdi's level of charisma. Now we'll have high voltage as So what do we take away from this? Electrodynamics is ideally a complete description of everything involving electricity and magnetism, but when it comes to charged particles traveling through thin spaghetti strands of metal, the theory of circuits is much more practical. If you want to know where electrodynamics is actually used in practice, look into optics and electric properties of matter. Of course, there's many more moral and philosophical questions around these videos. Is Veritasium being harmful by describing this incorrectly? Or does it not matter because the whole thought experiment is unrealistic anyway? Is Veritasium being helpful by encouraging people to pursue science? Or does it not matter because the facts that they're learning are just random trivia and not genuine understanding? If this were a hot new topic, I might give my opinion, but unfortunately I am now two months late because I'm lazy and video making is hard. Anyway, let's wrap things up. I'm continually impressed by electrodynamics, because in addition to describing circuits, it is also the basis for a huge variety of fields, including mechanical properties of solids, and even relativity. It stands on equal footing with early descriptions of quantum mechanics, despite having no quantum mechanics itself. It's such a great feeling to reach the end of an undergraduate course, and understand how all of these little disconnected fields are actually linked by a deeper theory. But at the same time, it's complicated, and the formalism of circuits is much more simple despite often being just as powerful and precise. It took me several hours to figure out how to break down a simple circuit correctly with the help of a computer program when I could have just used P equals VI. Being able to boil everything down to a simple set of rules involving abstract concepts like fields is philosophically satisfying, but it often doesn't help you solve practical questions. So don't learn electrodynamics to be a pedant and nitpick, Learn it because it's cool.